This is the story of Africa Airlines Flight 771. On the 11th of May 2010, an Airbus A330 departed Johannesburg, South Africa, bound for Tripoli, Libya, at about 9 p.m. Libyan time. The plane had been fueled up with 50 tons or 100,000 pounds of fuel for the nearly nine-hour flight. The flight progressed with no issues whatsoever, and by about 4.30 a.m., the pilots got in touch with Seba Control to get a weather update. Nothing alarming, and so the crew continued with the flight. In about an hour, as dawn started to set in, they got a more accurate weather report. It was a moderately clear day with six kilometers or about four miles of visibility. Not too bad, and well above the minimums for the approach to runway 09 at Tripoli. The pilots told the controllers that their estimated time of arrival was 6 a.m. As the plane closed in on Tripoli, the pilots could see the runway. But despite the promise of clear skies, a thin mist had begun to form around the airport in the early hours of the 12th of May. But it's nothing that the pilots couldn't handle. Nothing that caused any need for alarm. Today, they'd be flying a DME approach to runway 09. They were attempting to carry out what's known as a non-precision approach. In this, they'd have lateral guidance from beacons on the ground. But they had to watch their altitude. The beacons couldn't tell you if you were too high or too low. To compensate for this, the chart that they were using had a table of distances and altitudes. It basically tells you, hey, when you're this far out, be at this altitude. And if you follow the instructions right, you'll end up right at the foot of the runway. Or you could set your plane to descend at a constant angle at the right time. With that, the first officer lined the plane up with the runway and started the final descent down. Soon, they were just 410 feet above the ground. An automated callout, minimums, was made by the plane. At this point, they should have had the runway in sight, but they didn't. This concerned the first officer, who asked the captain if the approach should be abandoned. Before he could answer, the plane made another call out. 300. They were just 300 feet off of the ground. Immediately after that, another warning came. Too low terrain. This appears to have shocked the captain into action. He called for a go-round. They were too low, and this approach needed to be abandoned. The first officer acted swiftly. He disconnected the autopilot and increased power retracting the gear along the way. This seems like any other go-around. The plane was climbing and picking up speed. But then, the nose started to drop. The plane starts to drop from 450 feet, and the first officer calls for the flaps to be retracted. As the plane passed through their minimum descent altitude, once again, the plane set minimums. But this time, no pilot responded. The plane was still pitching down and losing altitude. They needed to act fast, as they didn't have a lot of altitude to spare. Time was of the essence this low. The captain called speed as the speed of the plane began to creep up, nearing its limit. But no one seemed to be bothered about the plane losing altitude. In the cockpit, the ground proximity warning systems were trying to convey the fact that they were dangerously low. But the plane never recovered. The A330 hit the ground short of the runway. And of the 104 people on board, only one little boy survived. To understand what had happened, the investigators talked to the pilot of the plane that had just landed minutes before Flight 771 was supposed to land. He said that it was misty, but he did not have any problem sighting the runway. If he had no problem with landing at Tripoli, what happened to Flight 771? Seeking answers, they started listening to the CVR. They heard the tower clear them in and give them the information that they needed. But in the cockpit, the approach briefing was not at all comprehensive. The captain just went over the basics like the runway that they'd be landing on. They'd be using the locator 09 procedure and the auto brake, which should be set to low. He did not go over how the approach would be conducted or anything like that. Sure, these pilots were familiar with Tripoli's airport. It was their base of operations after all. But... The lackluster approach briefing left gaping holes in their understanding of the approach. For example, the captain never mentioned how the non-precision approach would be carried out. You see, at most large airports, you'd be flying an ILS approach. That is very precise and very safe. 
beacons on the ground basically help guide you to the foot of the runway. But in this case, as mentioned before, they were flying a non-precision approach, which meant that they'd have to use beacons called BORs and DMEs on the ground to make sure that they are where they are supposed to be. As the name suggests, this isn't very precise, but pilots do get a helping hand from the automation of the plane. For example, if the airline programs the flight path into the computer, then in the managed mode, the plane can basically fly itself along the program flight path. This is known as the managed mode. The alternative is the selected mode, where you select what the plane flies. For example, you can select 000 on the heading display, and the plane will fly due north. The captain never clarified these things. Would they be flying the approach in the managed mode or the selected mode? We don't know. Then after that, we think that the approach checklist was carried out. There were very few formal callouts, so we can't really be sure. Finally, as the approach went on, the captain said, let us do what is the name, it is better, nav approach. It's approved, you know. He was asking the first officer to fly the approach in the managed mode. About 15 seconds later, the captain said something that would sow the seeds for this crash. He said, track FPA. FPA stands for flight path angle. You can set the FPA to, for example, let's say minus three degrees, and the plane will descend at minus three degrees. But in this context, that's not what it meant. When you're in the manage mode, you can either be in the heading slash vertical speed mode or the track slash FPA mode. When you're in the track FPA mode, like these guys were, the plane will follow the predefined flight path and follow the vertical profile. In this mode, you'll get a tiny circle with wings on your primary flight display called the bird. When he called out track FPA, he was just checking to see if the bird was correctly displayed on the primary flight display. But the first officer took this to mean that they were changing from a managed approach to a selected approach, as in he now had to manually select an angle and make the plane fly that. Now the plane was on final and they changed to the final approach mode. Since the plane was lined up, it should have been an easy approach, but the data showed how things started to go wrong. At 3.59 a.m. and 24 seconds, the first officer enabled the FPA at minus three degrees and the plane started descending. This was way too soon. Descending now wouldn't take them to the runway. We don't know exactly why he started the descent too soon. Maybe he confused the DME distance to the distance to the runway threshold or something like that. But for whatever reason, they started to descend. The first officer called out, minus three degrees, sir. But at this time, the captain was in contact with the pilot who was landing ahead of them. And the other pilot was warning him about the low-lying clouds. They then passed a beacon, Tango Whiskey, and no one noticed that they were lower than they were supposed to be. Now, both pilots are on two different pages. The captain thinks that the approach will be in the manage mode, since they didn't really have a clear conversation where they went, hey, we're changing into the selected mode. And the first officer thinks that they'll be in the selected mode. As they approached the minimums, the captain said to continue, expecting the runway to appear in front of them at any moment, as it had for the other pilot. But it wouldn't because they were nowhere near the runway. Then once the runway did not materialize, they had to go around. At first, the go-around seemed normal, nothing out of the ordinary. The plane was picking up speed and climbing. Four seconds after the go-around was initiated, the data showed something shocking. The first officer was pushing the nose of the plane down. He was suffering from what's known as somatographic illusion. When you're suffering from a somatographic illusion, you feel like you're pitching up excessively when you're not. This is exactly what happened to Amazon Air Flight 3591. Link on your screen right now. This is because the acceleration of the plane messes with structures in your head that help orient you. So the acceleration of the go-around is now disorienting him, but he's focused elsewhere. His focus is on the speed of the plane. You see, during an earlier flight, during a go-around, the plane went too fast and an overspeed alarm sounded. He wanted to avoid overspeeding again, and so was squarely focused on the speed of the plane and little else. He did not notice that they had begun to lose altitude 
At this point, the captain did make a few small inputs, but it wasn't large enough to trigger a dual input warning. This was made worse by the fatigue of the crew, which didn't help them make the right calls that day. The root of this crash was not the somatic graphic illusion, but the lack of CRM in the cockpit. Both pilots were on different pages, and that meant that they did not have a shared mental picture of what was happening, and that cost them dearly. Even when things were deteriorating, they were focused on their speed and did not notice that their plane was losing altitude. They only tried to recover two seconds before impact. By then, it was too little, too late. One thing that would have saved them was some feedback. On the 20th of April, 2010, they had another go-around, the one that we talked about before. But no one really analyzed that go-around to see what other mistakes the pilot made. Had that been done, this would have ended very differently. So what do you think? Do you think that this disaster could have been avoided if they had done more prep work on the go-around that happened on the 28th of April, 2010? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I will catch you guys next time. Stay safe.